stand and join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, first thing we always do is to approve the agenda as presented. Does anyone have any questions? Any uh, adjustments to the agenda? Now I got a motion by Rick Seiler. Second. Second by Maggie Bass to approve the agenda as presented. If there's no other comments, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposition? Okay, the agenda is approved, 5 0. First thing on the agenda, we are. Fortunate enough to have John Olson, who is running for uh, Minnesota Senate in District 20, and here just to introduce himself. We've done this in the past, and so welcome, John. Thank you very much. I uh, appreciate the uh, opportunity to address you tonight. I know we had planned on doing this a couple weeks ago, but we ran into some uh, some challenges. So thanks for inviting me back. Uh, my name is John Olson. I'm a candidate for Senate District 20 on the DFL side. Uh, I am originally from Minneapolis, graduated from Washburn High School back in 1986, at which point I had a, a nomination to attend the U.S. Naval Academy at Annapolis from then 5th District Representative Martin Olo Sabo. I graduated from Annapolis in 1990 and spent 21 years on active duty as an intelligence officer in the Navy before retiring and coming back home here to Minnesota. Uh, my wife and I found a, a great little home over in Cedar Lake Township, just about 14 minutes away from here. And we moved in there back in 2012, and we've made our home there since. Uh, in that time, since 2011, I spent uh, up until 2017 uh, helping my father. He, he, I, the reason I retired and came back home predominantly was because he'd been diagnosed with the mid-stages of Alzheimer's. So I knew I had a very finite amount of time to spend with him. And I watched his journey going through dementia, and it was a, a very difficult thing to see. Uh, in 2017, I realized that uh, I needed another, another direction in my life after losing my father. And I wanted to get back into service, so I started thinking long and hard about what that would mean for me. Uh, I had spent time, you know, earning a little bit of a living in retirement, teaching courses at the School of Law Enforcement and Criminal Justice with Metro State University, and also uh, national security related courses over at uh, Carleton College in the Political Science Department. And I've thoroughly enjoyed that teaching career, but I realized that service has always been in my blood. It's what I've done most of my adult life, and I wanted to get back into it. I did realize that after a career as an intelligence officer, I could, we could spend weeks talking about national security policy, and I think I could hold my own. But I also realized that if I wanted to get into, into politics, so to speak, I better learn a lot about public policy, because that's what we do here in Minnesota. That's what we focus on. So I used my post-9-11 GI Bill, and I went to the Humphrey School, and I finished up there in uh, August of 2018 with a Master in Public Affairs degree. And I've been incredibly enthused about the idea of serving our community uh, as the next state senator from Senate District 20. I jumped into this race back in October, and I've been bouncing around all over the district trying to attend the city council and township council meetings uh, as much as I can. I've been up to all three of the, uh, uh, the uh, county uh, board of commissioners meetings, and I'm getting ready to go back through um, another cycle on that. Uh, I, I am fortunate enough as a retired naval officer to have lots of time on my hands. And my intent, if I am elected in this position, is to, is to treat this as my full-time job. I'm not just going to go to walk up, up to St. Paul when, it's, you know, when we're in session. My job is to represent our district's interests up there all the time. Uh, I will tell you that some people have asked me, well, what are the issues you intend to run on? Well, they're not my issues. I am interviewing to be elected to become your state senator, and so I should be representing your issues up in the Capitol. And what I've heard, kind of in a nutshell, as I've gone around the district, is that everybody is most concerned about the cost of health care. A lot of people have health insurance in the state of Minnesota. We're in good shape there. But it's the cost of premiums, co-pays, prescription drugs, and all the other things. I think we have to find a solution to that if we're going to become, continue to be a great state. Secondarily is, is, the, uh, is the ag economy. A lot of our farmers have taken a big hit. They're still in uh, a little bit of a challenge right now. We've been spending a lot of time talking with farmers and. Even though I'm a city kid and I spent 25 years on the ocean, uh, I think I've uh, started to pick up what it means to be a farmer. And it's uh, pretty clear to me that it is not only uh, deeply involved in the science area, but also it is truly an art. And then the third thing I've heard about from a lot of people is their concerns about the education system here in Minnesota. 
We want to make sure that our kids uh, have the best education possible. I've always felt that the most important strategic investment any nation can make in its future is in educating its youth. It gives us a, a significant advantage over all other countries in the world if we educate our kids well. And co co-mingled with that from a lot of people that I've talked to is they want to see high-speed broadband internet across the whole state because it is a tremendous equalizer for us, not only in education, but also in economic opportunity. So those are the, the sort of the three and a half or four things that I've heard from people. Uh, I'm sure there are going to be many, many other issues to talk about. I, I see that you have a lot of things on the docket tonight. Uh, I wish I could stay, but there are only so many meetings in a month, and unfortunately a lot of them always happen on the same nights. So I'm going to split out of here and go talk to the Cedar Lake Township folks uh, right after this, unless anybody has any questions for me. Thank you very much for your time tonight. Thank you, Thank you John. Good luck. Thank you. Okay, the second thing on the agenda is uh, public comment on the ambulance uh, and EMS service. Uh, Mike, you're going to give a little introduction and then I will lay out the ground rules. Sure, I'll do a bit of a recap uh, considering that uh, the uh, purpose of uh, part of tonight's meeting is to uh, take any oral or public comment uh, that people have on the renewal of the ambulance service agreement that we have with uh, North Memorial Health. That uh, originally this was scheduled to have occurred on uh, February 18th. We didn't have a quorum, so we moved that period of commentary or the opportunity for that commentary to tonight's meeting. Uh, following this uh, would be uh, the uh, action where the council decides to move in whatever direction they want to move in. And uh, although that was originally scheduled for March 2nd because of, uh, again, the meeting on the 18th being canceled, uh, that moves to March 16th. And I know you're going to recap that. But what we had provided in, in your packet uh, that uh, it was, again, copied for tonight's meeting is that uh, on February 3rd, uh, the council had uh, gone through following significant debate and discussion on the renewal. Uh, the uh, council had directed us to uh, solicit public comments on the renewal of the ambulance service agreement, which begins May 1. In your packet, Mayor and Council, is uh, a listing of the 13 letters that we have received uh, in my office. And so uh, you can see uh, a number of those came in on February 14th, amended on uh, the night of the meeting, uh, February 18th and then we received one additional one which is shown in the amended March 2nd, so you should have about 13 pieces of correspondence uh, on that. Also included uh, with the packet tonight was uh, correspondence that was received on Friday uh, uh, as we put together the packets was information that was provided by North Memorial Health, uh, specifically that was a uh, letter that was provided to you by Mr. Rick Wagner, uh, who likely uh, will get up and talk tonight, who is the Director of Outstate Ambulance Service with uh, North Memorial. So that's in your packet. And then on your credenza this evening, we also received uh, late this afternoon, was another piece of correspondence from Mr. Paul Drucker, the Senior Director of the Ambulance Services for the <coughs> Clinic and ambulance that they wanted us to make sure that we provided uh, to you. So with, Mayor, with that, Mayor, I'll turn it back to you um, so you can uh, uh, provide the overview of how you're going to conduct uh, the receipt of public comment. Uh, and then I believe at the conclusion of that, uh, the council then can have discussion and decide uh, what direction you want to provide the city staff so that we can bring that back to you on March 16th. Okay. Thank you, Mike, for that. Uh uh, before I open the uh, floor up for public comment, a uh, couple things I want to note. Uh, one is, this is we're only taking comments on the ambulance EMS service. Uh, if someone comes up here and is, is starts talking about male health systems or the hospital or things like that, I will cut you off because that is not part of this decision. Uh, I don't. I'm not sure if people are aware that the city is not involved in the hospital. Uh, we've never been involved in the hospital. So the decision to go to Mayo was not a decision made by 
any city council uh, that uh, has served the citizens in Ukraine. The only thing the city has is we have the ambulance service contract for this area, and so that's is really the decision that we are making. So I just want to make sure that's clear. The other thing I think I should note is that at the end of the public comment, we might do some good discussion, but we will not be making a decision today. As Mike said, we may direct uh, staff maybe to get us some other additional information or maybe just uh, table it until we make actually a decision and, and have more uh, discussion on the next council meeting on the 16th. So, so with that in mind, uh, if you are going to make a public statement, I wish you'd come to the podium state your name and your address and uh, try to keep it as brief as possible and uh, from there uh, we'll go so i'm matt shurik and i live in cedar lake township in fact i was born there in the farmhouse uh, it will be 76 years ago on the 11th of march and uh anyway uh my wife has kidney, she had a kidney transplant and so she has to be uh, at a hospital that knows quite a bit about the antibiotics that she can have and can't have. Well, she ended up with a bladder infection a year ago and she ended up getting septic and it, it was a real uh, bad situation. Her blood pressure went up, her uh, temperature went up to almost 104. So I was able to get her to the emergency room in Burnsville. But anyway, uh, Hennepin County did the transplant, so they dictate to Burnsville what can be done and can't be done with antibiotics. So it's very important wherever the ambulance that New Break eventually hires or goes in contract with takes my wife to a hospital like uh, Burnsville or uh, um, the Hennepin County Center because they know exactly what they can do and can do with her. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Mayor Nikolai, member of the council. My name is Vern Oraskovich, 713 First Street Southeast in New Prague here. Had the chance to say a few words uh, a month ago or so, or whatever it was. <coughs> and I'll try and keep my comments relatively brief. I should be done within an hour. <laughs> uh, might be the only one here. <laughs> <laughs> one of the things, I've had the opportunity since that time, though, to visit with a lot of people. And many of these people I visited with have been at the fitness center which I've been a member for nine years. My wife says I exercise my jaws more than the rest of my body sometimes. But I, I just summarized some of the key things that I heard, when, whether it be in groups or individuals talking about the ambulance service. <clears throat> the common, the, I, list, I broke it down into three common responses. What's wrong with the current system? Are a lot of people complaining about the service? Is there a financial advantage to, for change? Is there a financial advantage to the city and me as a citizen of New Craig? Those are basically the three areas that I've heard. And the majority, almost all of those were in support of North. <clears throat> I said a few words at the, at the January meeting about the zone concept. And I did a little literature review and on May 20th, 2019, and very well held, I found a statement that says, you have the right to tell the ambulance where to take you, and if they are able to do so safely, they usually will. However, some ambulances are assigned to a specific zone and hospital, I didn't say hospital, no, specific, specific zones, and are not allowed to transport patients outside those territories. So I say, this is, I, I quote that from Very Well Health, May 20th, 2019. Um, and I have not been, has not been clarified to me if the mail operates in the zone concept where people that are, are transported must go to a, a mail 
facility or if they will ask the patient where they wish to go. North will ask their patients what hospital they want to go to. Um, <clears throat> if Mayo replaces North, it just becomes more dominant. They become more dominant in the healthcare system. They have a clinic, a hospital, and now possibly an ambulance service. Uh, I ask what's next, take over my dear friends at Parkview. There's one point I'd like to have you keep in mind, and I think it's important. Again, I did found this digging through some literature, and this is current. And I quote, North is the only, the only ambulance service in the state of Minnesota to earn the commission on accreditation of ambulance services, the gold industry standard for the industry. Do you as a council want a gold standard for the city? I ask that you have a gold standard for your ambulance service as well. Those people who work for North now currently live in New Prague, are residents here, they own their homes, they pay their taxes here, purchase their groceries here, and they might even stop up town for a beer. So that's those are my comments. I appreciate it. <coughs> Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Mayor, before we go on, I think maybe it should be pointed out is that uh, I believe both of the ambulance services are accredited that to the materials that we provided to you in January, both of them are accredited. Kirby, am I not correct? I believe so. Yes. I'm going to make sure. Because I attended your last meeting, remember? <laughs> and nobody was here. Rick. <laughs> My name is Mickey Berkey, and I live down at Mill Pond. I had occasion to use the ambulance last month. Oh no, actually it was at the end of January. Uh, I had a small stroke. I called the ambulance, they took me to town here and did a CAT scan and could tell that I needed something further, like an MRI, and I have a pacemaker. So they had to call around to find out who could do that. Uh, they called Mankino, they called uh, Softdale, they called, um, United. I said, well, you know, I got the pacemaker in. Yeah, but let's just go there. So we did. <laughs> I got there at 5 o'clock in the morning. I spent two and a half days there. And I got to tell you, the, I like going with the North Memorial Hospital or ambulances for the simple reason that everything I have is a lineup with the heart. So, boy, or my kids ever have it here, I was downtown because they were so darn used to me being down there for two th since 2002 um, to be able to get there. Otherwise, if you end up in Mankato or someplace else, uh-uh. Even though I lived there in Mankato one time, but I was in college, but otherwise, no. I, I prefer to stay with the North. And what he said, they all live here in New Bray. Actually, Randy lived in Faribault, but he still liked coming here to the job. So, <laughs> my other one was quitting. So that's all I have to say. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening. I'm Brad Shangor. I live on Columbus Avenue South here in New Prague. And um, I'm not here tonight to advocate for either EMS provider. Um, as a community board member at what was then Queen of Peace Hospital um, 10 years ago, I partic participated in the decision to have North Memorial be our EMS provider, and I have no regrets about that. Uh, they have provided good care to our community for the past decade. At the same time, I'm confident that if we go to a competitive bidding process, our community will get even better pre-hospital care than we're getting today, even if at the end of that process, you decide to continue with North Memorial Ambulance. Let me share just one example that illustrates how our community will miss out if you don't go to a competitive bid process. After North Memorial submitted their five-year renewal contract to the city a couple months ago, Mayo Clinic Ambulance came and presented and informed the council about a program called Community Paramedic because the benefits that Mayo feels that this program could bring to our community. In response to that new insight from our local healthcare system, 
Lord Memorial then sent a letter to the city saying that it has been operating a community paramedic program since 2008. The letter touted the value and the effectiveness of their program, stating that last year alone, their community paramedic program saved an estimated $400,000 in health care costs. So for the entire decade that North Memorial has been providing ambulance service to New Prague, they've also been running the community paramedic program that has generated huge savings, but not here, because they don't offer a community paramedic program in New Prague. Why is that? Why have we as residents of New Prague not been able to benefit from this program, and why have we not even heard about it until Mayo brought it up? Did North Memorial offer this program to you as city representatives and you declined it? Or has North Memorial never offered this service to you or to us, even when they were asking the city for a five-year renewal on their program? I think the answer is clear. When they didn't think they had any competition, they had no reason to offer anything more than they've been providing for the last decade. And now that this topic has come up, their letter stated that they'd be happy to discuss, quote, any community needs identified by the city council, unquote. So the current EMS provider in their letter just put the burden fully on you as the city council members to identify any community health care needs. Because if you don't ask for it, this example highlights that it probably won't be proactively offered. So how do you plan to identify those community health care needs? How will you learn enough about ambulance and other related services to know what you should ask for in the next ambulance contract? To me, the answer is simple. You learn from the two great health care systems sitting in the room tonight. As suggested by several city council members at the last meeting, sign a one-year extension with North Memorial Ambulance. Then go to a competitive bid where you can learn from both providers and maybe some other providers about the models of care that they offer, the technology they use, and what they're willing to commit to contractually. After that, then sign a multi-year contract with whichever organization you believe will best serve our community going forward. If you use that competitive process, all parties are gonna put their best foot forward. And I'm confident that the residents of our community will have even better pre-hospital health care than exists today, regardless of which organization you eventually choose as the long-term provider. Thanks for your time. Thank you. <clears throat> Any other comments? My name is Paul Drucker. I'm the Senior Director of the Mayo Clinic Ambulance Service. I'm not a resident of, uh, of Dupre. I've enjoyed my recent visits uh, over the last number of weeks and appreciate the opportunity to speak tonight. Just a couple com uh, comments. I think uh, you, you have the good fortune of having two competent ambulance services uh, to interested in providing ambulance services in this community. They, what it boils down, it's difficult to measure. How, how do you measure us, one versus the other one? And, and you know, bottom line, as, as indicated, we're both CAS accredited, and I think those standards are, are publicly available to review and, and see what that minimum standard is there. We're both governed uh, as ambulance services by the Minnesota statutes, chapter 144E, that outline how we're all expected to operate within the state of Minnesota. It's easy to debate the perceived and real differences between us, but we're two different organizations. So of course there's gonna be nuance, there's gonna be differences in how we approach things. Um, you have to go back to the standards that are readily available. Mayo Clinic's interest uh, isn't really in how things have been done. Mayo Clinic's interest in adding ambulance services to this community is the future really of where do we wanna go with 
uh, community care, and it not only includes ambulance services and EMS and 911 response, but it's it's deeper than that. It's more than that. It's connecting, continuing to invest in the future, just as Mayo Clinic has done uh, since 2011. Is continue to invest in the in the facilities and the services. Uh, this is another expression, really, of not that. It's not just ambulance services. Um, so we're about the next generation of ambulance services and community care. And as Dr. Hebel highlighted in our presentation several weeks ago, he talked about the home hospital program. Um, those are that, that's one of many uh, community-based strategies incorporated or an expression of the ambulance service within the community that uh, we're actively engaged in. We'll have our first patient enrolled in that program in Northwest Wisconsin this summer. Um, and piloting that through the course of this year with the expectation that we will expand that across the footprint of the Mayo Clinic Health System. And really it's about trying to figure out how to keep as much care local as possible. Helping people stay in their own homes. People don't like to go to the hospital. They want to stay in their own home and be cared for in their own home and that's what we want to figure out. Our goal, our goal as well is it's not to hit the merits of North Memorial versus us. We know Rick, we know Terry, we know many North Memorial colleagues. They're a competent service, they're good people, and their intent is great and they deliver a good service. It's not really about that. Again, it's going back to the next level. Just last Thursday, it was announced that uh, Mayo Clinic Ambulance was accepted into the Emergency Triage, Treat, and Transport program that the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services announced about a year ago. We're the only Minnesota-based ambulance service that was uh, selected for this program. It's a five-year pilot program looking at new strategies to deliver EMS care in better ways to meet patient care needs. Just transporting patients to the emergency department isn't the answer. Patients have a variety of different needs, and the emergency department doesn't, frankly, always answer those needs in an efficient way because emergency departments, for the most part, are quite busy. This, this pilot program is intended to uh, bring tele-emergency medicine, telehealth solutions directly to patients' homes. Um, it's to transport them to destinations other than emergency departments, mental health facilities, detox, uh, urgent cares, uh, and a variety of other locations that might better fit through more astute uh, triaging what the patient's needs are. To complement that, we just finished on Saturday a one-year pilot of using telemedicine solutions directly in patients' homes. And the purpose of that study was just to assess the connectivity of devices that we would take from ambulances right into a patient's home. So not on every situation. When we have an emergency, uh, we could all agree that when there's an emergency, we follow uh, probably almost verbatim the same scripts on how to deal with a patient in a cardiac arrest or having a heart attack or having a stroke. But that's not all the patients we transport. That's a small minority of the patients we transport are patients that are in arrest like that. It's the patients that have complicated health histories as the gentleman illustrated with his wife. It's trying to, it's trying to bring other uh, input into those decisions about what is best for the patient in the time of need. So we finish that and we have taken the next step on how to bring a physician live in partnership with the patient, their family, and our paramedic team right into the patient's home. The home hospital platform, as I mentioned, will start this summer. Um, and you know, I think we're, we're poised to take this community to that next level of what EMS care is. It's not what we know now. It's the future of where we all want to be. So we, bottom line, would enjoy the opportunity to, to provide care in partnership with you, the community, as you, the city of New Private owns the license for EMS services in this community. We would love the opportunity to work together with you and together have direct input on the health and care of all of our community members. And we look forward, hopefully, to the opportunity to do that in the future. Thank you. Thank you. My name is Marty Herman. I live on uh, 2nd Avenue, Southwest. Uh, I have uh, grew up in Montgomery, lived in this area my entire life, graduated from Montgomery High School. 
uh, from there, uh, did medical training at, uh, uh, here in the state of Minnesota, University of Minnesota. And uh, I came back to practice medicine uh, in New Prague uh, back in 1993, and I spent my entire professional career here um, in, uh, in New Prague. And uh, I worked for Mayo Clinic Health System. I'm the medical director of Mayo Clinic Health System in New Prague since 2011, and I appreciate the opportunity to talk to the council uh, regarding this issue. I've been in front of the city council during my uh, professional career. Uh, this will be the second time. Um, the first time I came to the council was uh, 10 years ago, actually, to discuss the same issue. And uh, at that time, we were, uh, as a medical practice uh, in this uh, community, uh, encouraging the council to consider a, uh, a broader EMS strategy for, the, for this community. We thought that it was in the patient's best interest that uh, uh, the city moved to an advanced life support uh, uh, system and uh, North Memorial stepped up to the plate and provided us with that system, and it's been good. And um, it's helped the community of New Prague and probably has uh, uh, been a, 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 a major uh, assistance to save lives and get people to the care they need faster. Um, I don't think there's many people in the community who would argue that that was a bad decision looking backwards. I think uh, we would all say from the physician's perspective and from the perspective of our emergency room colleagues and uh, our north providers that that was the right thing to do. And uh, um, it, it brings me back to today and, and why I'm back in front of you again. Um, medicine changes very rapidly and in, in my almost 30 years of being a practicing physician, it's never changed faster really than it has in the last four or five years. Um, in fact, nobody in this field thinks it's going to stop changing. In fact, we feel that the pace of change is probably going to accelerate. And because of the changing environment we live in, it's extremely important that uh, uh, the healthcare delivery locally stay nimble, and uh, we have to be able to respond and make faster changes than we might have been used to back in 2010. There was a lot of reluctance back then to go from a BLS service community home to an ALS service. And some of the arguments that I've heard that are being made are the same arguments that are being made today. It's about jobs, it's about change, it's about um, you know, service and choice. Um, and uh, I, I want to express uh, uh, the, some of the practice ideas here in town, the physicians that actually work here, including um, the non-male physicians all want the, the health care in this town to get better. And that's the primary reason why we're here today is uh, uh, we want to see um, more promotion of more ideas, especially in the EMS. Um, I appreciate some of the statements that have been made so far. I appreciate the fact that we live in a community that's close to the metro and, there's, and there needs to be choice for patients who uh, want to visit excellent centers of care uh, north of us in the metro area, and we're spoiled that way in Minnesota. We have uh, probably and arguably the best medical care in the entire country here in Minnesota, so we have choice, and that's a good thing. But a couple comments just about um, about Mayo's strategy with EMS, and, and it kind of uh, follows through the, the, the tenure strategy for Mayo in general has been uh, stated as bold forward, which is, uh, um, a slogan to represent the idea that we're going to move things forward ahead and and it's just it's bound to change we, you know we, we have to come with that with that environment mail wants increased local infrastructure uh, they do not want to take medicine away from new Prague and close the hospital uh, they want more delivery here in the town at home more specialty service more EMS service those are all things that are good for our community um, they want, they, we, they want to deliver uh, a higher level of service that we currently have had. And I've watched Mayo, uh, I've watched the hospital and the environment here struggle over the years that I've been here because we've been disjointed. Uh, we've been supported by whoever we can typically get to provide us with the service that we need. And because of that, it's not, it wasn't uncommon historically to have uh, specialists and services come from multiple different places at the same time. 
and that's not efficient, it's not integrated, and it delays us in our progress to move forward. Um, in order for um, from mail to accomplish the local delivery enhancement, it's imperative uh, that we integrate. It's imperative that uh, we become efficient. And it's imperative, it's imperative that the community engage uh, the, the, the delivery of service, which involves making decisions like this uh, regarding EMS. Um, I implore the council to give the uh, bidding process, this process of evaluating uh, what the service in e of EMS for the near future should be in New Prague. Um, again, uh, um, North Morrow has been a, a very good partner and they served us well and they should be congratulated and thanked. Um, and in the event uh, the city council chooses uh, to resume North service, we will do our best uh, within our local community to um, integrate as best we can with them and, and uh, be good partners. Um, I also encourage you to look at uh, the, the uh, opportunities that you have uh, with one of the finest uh, systems in the, in the world. Um, and in the words of uh, Herb Brooks, thinking of coming into the uh, 40th anniversary here of the Miracle on the Ice, I, I'll never forget the statement he made about um, great moments and great opportunity, meaning that great moments are made by great opportunity. We have a great opportunity here uh, to make a special uh, uh, shift, possibly, in how we uh, manage our local health. And uh, this brings the physicians, myself included, to the table here. Um, and uh, we want to endorse moving forward. Um, I was disappointed, uh, to be honest, that we were contemplating just a kind of rubber stamp renewal of, uh, of a service of any kind, much less EMS. And EMS probably changes faster than anything else that we do. Um, I think we need to uh, thoroughly look into these proposals and determine um, what's at stake, uh, how do we advance our system, how, do, how does our community get healthier, and how do we partner with, uh, with our major players uh, uh, locally. So thanks again for listening uh, to my statements. Um, I appreciate it for being a, a, a medical professional here at New Pride, um, and uh, I hope that we can continue to grow. Uh, and. Uh, and for the next generations of physicians and also patients that uh, we serve them well. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening. Uh, Rick Wagner from North Morrow Health Angels, uh, Director of the All State Operations. Uh, I don't live here in the New Prague area. Um, just a couple of clarifications. Uh, I think I included it in the letter on the second page of the letter that I uh, sent to the council. But I think you know, with the talk about the community paramedic and the home hospital thing, you know that that we didn't offer the community paramedicine as an option until mail came to town, and that's true that we didn't offer that. But our viewpoint of um, community paramedicine, while we've been in it for a long time, one of the first that got into the game, I think it's important to look at the what I put in print or in the tallies and what a community paramedic is um, on the second page of that letter. And it's an advanced paramedic that works to increase access to primary and preventive care and decrease the use of emergency departments, which in turn <coughs> decreases health care costs. So it talks about, you know, it's, it's building on a health care system. And we do that in North Moral, our community paramedics, we work very well. We did save the, the community $400,000, but it was working with the health, with the hospital, save that. It wasn't part of our ambulance department that we worked to do that work. So while some of our paramedics do function as community paramedics, they don't work on the ambulance while they're being, while they're doing the community paramedic work. So it's two different, really two different job classes per se. <coughs> So I just think we need to be careful that we don't mix those things together, that it isn't community paramedics doing what, that, that it isn't the same people doing the same thing. And our viewpoint is that it's, you know, males certainly can come down and do community paramedic work even if they didn't have the ambulance. They have to, you know, that's not part of the license. 
that's a whole different thing. They don't need a license to do that. They're not regulated by the license that the state of, or that the city of New Prague has. You don't, they, they want to operate under that ambulance license that you have to be community paramedics. So same with the home, home hospital thing. So um, we have a very successful community paramedic program. Um, we do use video, they do video visits all the time. So that technology is there. We just haven't taken it into the ambulance. And, you know, kudos to uh, Mayo on doing the ET3 study. That's gonna be an important study for the future ambulances and different, you know, where do we, different patient destinations. We're all watching that, wait and see what's gonna happen. And it is a big change and things are changing. But I think you need to remember, you still need an ambulance in town. You still have to follow the rules and regulations outlined by the state of the Emergency Medical Services Regulatory Board for preparedness for the ambulance service. And, and that's what we've been doing for the last 10 years. So, and we've been, you know, that's what our focus is. And that's what our focus were, was on uh, when we suggested the contract renewal. And we would be interested in doing something with mail as far as community paramedicine if they wanted to, but it, again, it's the health system. And would, would it be appropriate for community paramedics from North Memorial to do, certainly could do that. And Dr. Wilcox put it in his letter uh, that he had wrote to the council on January 29th that it would be a good opportunity to work in conjunction and develop a partnership. So there's many options out there that we'd be interested in talking to. But we, our goal is to renew the ambulance contract and we don't consider community paramedicine as part of that ambulance contract for the license that you hold with the state of Minnesota. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> no other comments? Okay, I guess I'll make a motion to close the public hearing. Second. Second by Maggie Bass. There's no other public comments. All in favor of closing public hearing say aye. 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 Any opposition? Okay. I want to thank everyone for their comments. Uh, as I mentioned before, that uh, we are not uh, going to spend any more uh, time on this right now. Uh, we will be obviously addressing it at our next council meeting. So Mike, uh, from the standpoint, I think we've probably got pretty much all the, the details that we need for uh, the next meeting. Yeah, we can get the, you know, once we get the minutes and get it summarized. And okay. Any questions from the council? Okay, again, thank you everyone for their comments. Appreciate it. Next on the agenda, Mike. Or oh, uh, Chris, excuse me. That's all right, I'm sure Mike will have a I'm sure. Yeah. Mike's sweating it out already with Ken not being here. So we don't want to put any more stuff out of that one. The only thing I'd like to point out in this one is that uh, uh, in addition to the uh, packet of material that you have from uh, Chris Cabot and the agreement Just is uh, we received a uh, version number three of that and that agreement late this afternoon. And so I'm going to present that yes. is a, a listing of the changes that came this afternoon highlighted in the follow It should be in your credenza. Um, that's what uh, we were notified of uh, late this afternoon. And then Chris has a revised handout. Uh, on the uh, cost estimates and the allocation of where funding is projected to come from um, that uh, has been revised from what is in your packet. So uh, if you'll uh, make note of those uh, two items uh, for Chris's presentation. Okay, well, uh, Mayor, members of the City Council, uh, for you here is uh, the uh, consideration of the resolution approving the cooperative construction agreement and authorizing its execution. Um, the uh, Main Street Junk Highway 19 project is currently out to bids. We're scheduled to open bids here on this Friday, Friday morning. 
Um, and then as part of this project, as this project is being led by the city uh, through a process called the uh, delegated contract process, um, it's standard procedure for uh, them, MnDOT, to MnDOT State Aid to put together a corrupt cooperative construction agreement, which is obviously the, the detailed agreement that you got before you here. Um, we have been through it. Uh, as Mike noted, the current one is version three, and there was a few clerical items that uh, uh, had to be corrected today. Um, Mike got demoted. He was listed as the uh, city engineer in the agreement. So. Um, so that was basic, basically the main items. Um, so again, the city attorney and uh, myself, as well as Glenn and Mike have, have reviewed it. Uh, we've gotten comments back to them about a couple weeks ago. Um, most of them were pretty minor, and then I had some, some questions regarding uh, MnDOT's share of contribution in the agreement. Um, and like I noted here before the meeting, I was uh, pleasantly surprised um, uh, when the agreement came back on Friday, they had provided more funding than I was anticipating, um, about $169,000 in additional funding that basically is in favor of the city. Mostly it was related to um, MnDOT projects are allowed a certain percentage of the con roadway construction allowance. They can allot to aesthetics. And I questioned why they weren't contributing any or very little to aesthetics, and uh, I was anticipating a smaller amount, a small amount, but they came back again with about 169,000 increase in that. So that was that was nice. Um, just to point out, uh, some the dollar, the agreement lists a bunch of dollar dollar amounts, and some of them are more actually just more uh, related to MnDOT themselves. Probably the one that's Worth noting is the one that's the, almost the bottom line, the 6.1 million. That is what MnDOT has calculated as their share of the project. Now they go through a line item of, of all the items that they're going to pay for, like how much curb and pavement and all these things. And based on the current engineer's estimate, that is the share of the, of the project that they will cover. So what I want to differentiate or point out is, so, so that doesn't talk about the city share of this project. So city share, since the city is leading the project, there's portions of this project that's the city's share of the project. They don't care about that. They're just outlining the stuff they're going to pay for. So this summary that we that I just handed out um, today is um, reflects those dollars that were that came on Friday. I revised it here um, before today, and I just want to kind of maybe go through these just quickly to differentiate um, kind of what all, what all these dollars mean. Uh, the item is kind of highlighted in pink, the 10.8 million. That is the estimated contract construction. <coughs> There's a difference between construction cost and project cost. So the estimated construction cost is 10.8 million. About 800,000 of that is actually um, uh, what we call lighting force account work that will actually be done by New Prairie Utilities and be refunded through that, uh, that fe federal grant that the city is getting. So the bid amount, the, bid, the estimated bid contract is estimated to be just over $10 million. Um, if we go down to the first yellow highlighted item, so we, we estimate uh, some contingencies and, and uh, other items that uh, project related costs etc um, so the total estimated project is estimated at 12.6 million that covers all the uh, soft costs and related cost engineering administrative cost bonding etc and then in this next stretch where you see the uh, number of lines in blue this is kind of the breakdown of how the, all the funding is, is expected to play out all the items in red are what MnDOT is contributing to the, again, to the project, and you can see how those are all broke out. And again, it's about, that, those all total $6.1 million. And again, just a reminder that these pre, are pre-bid estimates, so the truth will be after the project's bid and we review these, and this, this will all be calculated based on those bid prices. Um, and then at the very bottom of that sheet, uh, the summary sheet. Um, I just highlighted again the, the 
again, total estimated project cost, and how did that compare to the feasibility study that was done back in 2018? So you can see the second column there, 12.1 million was what was estimated in the feasibility study. We're currently at about 12.6 million, and kind of where the differences were. Um, some of the more significant estimated differences are uh, in the utility, sanitary, and water, and mostly in the sanitary related to just some design changes that happened as the project progressed. Most notably, we had uh, thought we were going to be able to use an existing sanitary pipe that was under the railroad, and um, ultimately that ended up not being feasible, so we had to revamp it during our final design. The other thing that came out of it is, as we did the at comprehensive sanitary sewer study last year, we had discovered or found out that we could eliminate a lift station, the light, what we call the library lift station. But by doing that, we needed to reroute the sanitary sewer, uh, redirect it on Main Street. Um, and actually, there's a stretch that gets a little deep. So that added some cost to the sanitary, but in the end, it's going to save the city a lot of money by eliminating that lift station. And then, eliminating maintenance and things like that. So those are some of the changes that have kind of occurred as we went through the whole whole design process. So um, so that's kind of uh, where we're at at this point. And again, this will be reviewed and reevaluated after the bids. Um, I should point out again that Cooperative construction agreement outlines MnDOT share of the project. Now, after the bids, it will be adjusted. So, if those items that they said they're going to pay for go up or they go down, their share at that number will, will be revised with that based on those bids. So, I guess with that, uh, any questions? If if the bids come in higher, or that, who has the final say in saying that the project will not be done? Um, is it a joint? Yes, it, and that's covered in here too. Now, if, the way they, at, at this point, MnDOT has covered 100% of the cost for bidding the project. If this had to be rebid for some reason, they are putting the responsibility to rebid the project on the city. And that would be the cost to republish and uh, go through the bidding process again. And so that is covered in the agreement. That was a question we had, and they they elected saying no we're not going to change it so um do you see any dangers of that happening um if you'd asked me a few weeks ago i i would have said no but uh we there's been some recent bidding activity going on out there and um, I, i'm a little bit apprehensive on what we're going to have on friday so we'll we'll find out um the the agreement basically gives both agencies the ability to um, request a rebid and having to justify why it needs to be rebid. So that could be MnDOT or that could be us. And again, we'll analyze what is what is the impacts after the bid to the city versus what is the impacts here to the state. And that will be coming back up to us on the 16th? Yeah, we'll, we'll of course analyze this right away after Friday. So by early next week, we'll know where we stand and then the it, the recommendation to award would be on the 16th, I anticipate on the 16th. If that was to happen, um, 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 is there a possibility that we could call a city council meeting and get that done before the 16th so that the um, um, timing for the next bid is quicker? It, that, that's, that's a good question, but I don't think it really gains us a whole lot. We still have to follow the, um, the public improvement, the public advertising process. If we were to rebid, we would probably be looking at making some type of adjustment to schedule. And again, I, I don't want to jump to a whole lot of conclusions yet. That would be something we would bring on the 16th if the recommendation between Vendot and the city uh, is to do something different. And will we know then sometime next week? Will you notify us so that we um, can start uh, planning on how we're going to go about it? Well, we'll be integrally involved uh, with Chris as we take a look at the bids. One of the steps uh, in the conditions of even being able to award is getting this agreement completed and up through the, the MnDOT process mm -hmm. that it has to be done in order in order for bids to be awarded. 
So if you guys are scheduling, you're going to get the bids um, probably Friday or, or by Monday. Right. Sure. right. We're opening bids Friday morning here. And, and then are you going, you're going to introduce that to the uh, uh, MnDOT and go through the state process and any jurisdictional governments? Um, yeah, MnDOT has to do what they call concurrence of awards. So they want to look at, um, number one, they look at the bids where the dollars come in at. They also look at the contractor who has to submit a certain percentage of uh, uh, what they call uh, DBEs, disadvantaged business enterprises, so a percentage of minority contractors. And that's really, it's more of an administrative. And if they're okay on both of those accounts, then they'll, they'll, walk, they'll give us the, the, the okay, the green light. Well, for reasons that you're already aware of, we're really tight scheduled, so I'm just wondering if we're, if there's a failure in the system, is there any way that we can advance it quicker at all? No, well, we can't begin to react until we know what we're dealing with in the first place, and that uh, under section three, three, one, two, and three uh, in the agreement, talks about the bids and the award and that uh, it's subject to concurrence by the state in the award of bid. So obviously the first thing we're gonna do is Chris will put together the bid tab and we'll take a look at it. Uh, what does it do to the city's share? What does it do to Midnight's share? And Midnight's gonna have to decide and looking at that, even with this agreement in route and in process, is do those numbers look favorable to them and do they have the funding to be able to pay for their share? Right. Okay. So. How did we get on such a tight <coughs> timeline here again? It just seems it's the same timeline that we've been under, albeit that uh, we would have preferred to have been out to bid earlier this year. But going through the completion of the design process, as well as the MnDOT review of all of the uh, design issues that we went through with this being a joint project. Uh, it ended up taking uh, SEH uh, uh, a little bit longer on their end, as well as MnDOT in their review, and going through all of the processes uh, with district, and then the submittals that went all the way up to the central office, uh, ultimately just took longer than expected. But uh, the time frame that we're operating under right now uh, is under the schedule that Chris had, and. Uh, you know that we showed you several months ago yeah just as a reminder the, the final plans were that, that were sent to MnDOT were basically those were dated in November um, thank you we approved them in early December um, this where we're at right now with this cooperative agreement process this isn't uncommon that it's kind of like this they once they approve plans usually that's about the time we see the draft we get it reviewed and get it approved bring it to council we we only have to, we have to prove this before we can open bids, so we're okay. This is taken care of tonight. And then MnDOT has to um, approve this before we can award the contract. But again, it's pretty straight, straightforward. But in all my experiences with the cooperative agreements, this is kind of the process, especially when we're in a spring situation or coming into spring like this. What time does the bids open on Friday? Uh, 10 o'clock. And that's in this room or downstairs? Right yep. Chris, can, uh, you mentioned that the state, <coughs> this, you're, you're happy that the state is contributing more. I can't remember, maybe you covered this already, but what was the difference in the state's contribution or how you calculated in your feasibility study versus what they uh, they came up with? Were about 6% or so off on that. And was there something that just uh, we thought they would pay for and they're not? Or is it just a difference in categories that they get, some stuff got moved in categories they don't pay for? Uh, I would have to drill into really specific line items to, to verify that. I, I don't recall. It could have been just conservative cost estimates on some of the roadway stuff. I think there's also a little bit more in terms of, um, um, you know, we, we have to pay a sh certain share of parking and a certain share of sidewalk, and so it may have been just assumptions at that time. Okay, it changed. Yeah, and it, and again, at the feasibility study it was making a lot of assumptions on what we thought was, you know, how much the state was going to cover on certain elements and stuff. So, and originally the feasibility thought that we'd be doing a general levy contribution, but now we're not doing any general levy. Yeah, and, and that had to do with, and you can see the state aid is, 
has increased. And what it, what it is is there was some, so there was items that I thought uh, during the feasibility phase were gonna be funded from the uh, federal ATP-7, what we call uh, the, that federal grant that, that the city's getting. And it was just a matter of, of what category the, that the funding can come from. Um, as it turns out, that could not be used for landscaping, but it was able to be used for a lot of the lighting and some of the other things. And so it changed what was eligible, what we could use state aid money for. And so I've always said that if we have an opportunity to use the, the municipal state aid funding that we have, we should do that. So it was able, we were able to shift that from general levy to state aid. Um, and yeah. It, 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 it's really to the city's advantage whenever we have an opportunity to use state aid eligible funding for state aid eligible items that we should do that. There, there will still likely be some general levy contribution though, won't there? It depends on, again, it depends on how the bids come in. If we have, you know, things come in a little bit higher, that's where the reliever will be. With well, the, I just think we committed a certain dollar amount to the park here. I thought. The, at, at this point, these numbers do not necessarily have correct. Okay. It, doesn't it, reflect any it, it does not, and that presentation is going to be coming at the March 16th meeting. So, if the council was to concur based on the recommendation from that committee to do something, that's likely where that would have to go would be under the general levy. Right. I think originally we had kind of thrown a number in there thinking that we, we had about $60,000 yeah. in to purchase property that subsequently was taken okay. care of. Wasn't the reason the general levy is, the, the initial contract was, we were gonna fund the whole thing, and then that was gonna pay us a million dollars over the next six years, so that changed also. Yeah. So all of a sudden they found extra money. Okay, and that's a big deal. Yes. Yeah. Okay, any other questions? I'll move the resolution. Okay, I will second it. I got a motion by Rick Seiler, second by Chuck Nikolai to approve the resolution. There's no other comments? All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposition? Okay, it passes 5 0. Thank you, Thank Chris. You, Chris. Looking forward to hearing the screams uh, of joy at the. Uh, <laughs> I preach on Friday at 11 o'clock. As a construction worker for 30 years, I preach. Patience, everybody. It's going to go through good. Okay, good. Mike, next, uh, the chart and application. Yep, give me a second to get set up here. If you don't mind. Look at Mike. Our little boy can play with the computer. <laughs> <laughs> little boy. Thank you for that vote of <laughs> Well, I'd be the same way. I'd probably say, okay, Barb, you're running. <laughs> here from chart uh, Steve Cox um, but uh, I just wanted to acknowledge that you're here uh, you'll be able to win later if there's something that uh, uh, we need assistance on but I just wanted to uh, acknowledge your attendance in front of the council uh, that he is the, the rep from chart that's here tonight I'm going to try to walk through some of the same materials that Ken normally goes through uh, but as you well know this is not my normal forte so I'm gonna do the best that I can in trying to uh, deliver this overview. Um, the current item that we have uh, on the uh, opening matter here is a request for a comprehensive plan amendment and a rezoning to two properties uh, to I-1 Light Industrial in the Plan of Charging Second Edition. Um, Planning Commission had previously uh, held uh, a public hearing on this proposed comprehensive plan amendment and for the rezoning of two properties owned by chart in the plan in second edition located at the north end of First Avenue Northwest. Uh, and taking a look at it, chart uh, initiated. Yeah, I 
no batteries. But uh, I know I haven't talked that long already. Um, that uh, Clark keeps pressing a button. <laughs> For some reason, uh, they don't seem to last very long. That uh, chart uh, has a need for more exterior storage and a desire to utilize uh, their land uh, that they own uh, that's been largely unused since they purchased it back uh, when it was planted in 2012. Um, they're proposing that the following two lots here, this is at the north end of First Avenue, this is across um, Phillips Creek, and uh, they have outlot A here is what we're talking about, and outlot B, and outlot B, uh, I'll have to go back, is the one that's got uh, the uh, barn, uh, the storage uh, uh, facility that uh, is on it, but in the process, any of the actions proposed tonight do not and I want to repeat that, do not, where do I, can I get the red arrow, there it is, do not include any part of outlot B on the south side of Phillips Creek. So there's no proposed uh, action regarding anything on the south side. But if you remember, you come up First Avenue here and you go across the, uh, the creek here to get to this side, uh, none of the rezoning or uh, land use is changing uh, that parcel. That what is proposed is under the comp plan is uh, outlot A uh, would be uh, ultimately rezoned from RM medium density residential to I1 light industry about 3.9 acres and outlot B would go from RL90 which is single family residential to I1 light industrial uh, it's about four acre four acres. But in order to rezone the property, it has to fit within the city's comprehensive plan. And at this, and at this time, the current zoning of the land fits with the comp plan, and therefore Chart is proposing to amend the comprehensive plan in order to be able to rezone this, this property. Hey Mike, just a question. Okay. Can it, like outlot B, is it mean that part of it is not being rezoned? Does that have to be replanted or anything? No, uh, that uh, the, the council can do the rezoning that uh, there's a natural barrier there with Phillips Creek to differentiate where the rezoning would occur. So we're rezoning uh, outlot B, but only that part of outlot B located north of Phillips Creek. Is, was that, is how was that, that the purpose uh, behind that? Was that to avoid um, any bridges or rebuilding any bridges? know that that still may occur depending upon what they want to do but it's intended to uh, be a good neighbor to <coughs> landowners to the south so that really nothing is occurring on the south side of the creek property uh, that impacts any of the adjacent uh, uh, users of that property and that alleviate pretty much what the uh, um, um, the people that live along first there um, uh, they were they were mentioning a couple different things uh, there were concerns expressed in the public hearing about traffic, uh, like from the existing operation, and concerns about noise. And so, there are some elements contained within the uh, recommendations and conditions that are attached with the rezoning in an attempt to address some of that. Um, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. Go ahead. There was also work done by, uh, coordinated by Ken, and the traffic study was completed in December of 2018. Uh, they did find that there were some high speeds were reported on northbound traffic and the police did complete enforcement activities uh, following that traffic count so there was an attempt to try to take a look at uh, addressing some of those elements so if you go to and i'm not going to go through probably as much as uh, ken does but uh, that uh, the action that we have to consider in this process is that they've applied to amend the comp plan and resolve the two properties. Uh, it was platted in 2012 to consolidate properties um, for a new building uh, at that time, which got built. Uh, the platted land is north of the creek. Uh, they're proposing to reguide and resolve the lots A and B, as I've already indicated. Uh, they're both proposed, all lot A and B are both proposed to be rezoned to I-1 light. Uh, they 
intend to use all line B north of Creek uh, for exterior storage of finished products, used equipment and storage trailers, and then to utilize the existing pole building for light manufacturing. And uh, the second item that we'll have, depending on your actions on this first one, uh, will be to consider exterior storage uh, as a conditional use in an I-1 light industrial district. Um, staff does not support rezoning, uh, as uh, I've already alluded to, rezoning the portion of the outline B that lies south of the creek to industrial, as it would be mostly unusable for industrial purposes due to a conservation easement located there and to maintain the buffer to the residential wall uh, to the area to the south. Uh, the, as I mentioned, we have four residents in that provided commentary. One of those residents has subsequently moved away. Uh, that was um, Mr. Russ Shearick. Uh, Russ sold his property and, uh, and uh, left the neighborhood, so he no longer lives there. Is that house going to stay there then, or is um, 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 do that, the, the, that resident have an opportunity to express themselves, the, the new resident? I'm, I'm not following you. The new resident that just purchased the property, did they have an opportunity to see this? The open, the, or have a or come to the hearing and stuff like that? Well, the public hearing notices that uh, dealt with uh, that public hearing went to all of the existing property owners of record at that time. And at that time, that was Mr. Shearing. Yeah. Okay. He subsequent to that public hearing sold the property. So there, there is, we are making a decision um, based on the old owner of the property. <clears throat> We're required to address the issue with the residents of record at the time that the public hearing was held. Right. I can presume or would hope to believe that Mr. Sherry conveyed any concerns or issues to the purchaser of his property but we're not required to hold an additional public hearing, hearing because the property ownership changed. Right, so nobody's gonna come up later on and go, well, I had no input on this. That can always happen, but he, that person would not have been the record, the property owner of record at the time that the hearing was held. Okay. Um, as, a, as I mentioned, the concerns about traffic, light and noise, uh, from those areas. Uh, staff is continuing to investigate the issues. Uh, the traffic study was completed. Police patrols, uh, Jim could address if need be, were increased. And light and sound have been monitored with no uh, recent issues uh, found there. Staff and the Planning Commission recommend uh, approval of the resolution to amend the comprehensive plan and the council's consideration of that uh, to amend the comprehensive plan that does require a fourth fifth vote, all four out of the five, and then uh, the following action, if the approval of the resolution to amend the comp plan occurs, would then be to introduce the rezoning ordinance tonight, and then to consider its adoption at March 16th. That action also requires a four-fifth vote to uh, uh, ultimately uh, adopt it. In uh, taking a look at the property here is the aerial view, and uh, one of the questions uh, that you might have in mind, as well as uh, what I did, is that uh, this property is currently uh, uh, residential, uh, medium density residential, and single family residential. And the in that residential neighborhood, which you see in this whole entire area, is the community center or the hockey facility is uh, is an authorized use in a residential neighborhood the football stadium and facility is a residential uh, is, is authorized to, to be in a, in a residential neighborhood and so when you take a look at it and with the the vacant ground here is uh, there's not likely to be any single family construction built in and around in this residential so when you take a look at uh, the request by chart to ask that these be zoned uh, I wonder industrial uh, it fits because it's adjacent to existing I one that they have uh, right across the creek directly to the, the south and again I lost my stupid pointer but, uh, 
uh, any any way. So the the initial question would be is that why should we authorize uh, the uh, I one zoning? Well, it does fit within the, the neighborhood. It's not encroaching any further into anything across the street. Their access is going to be from uh, the south into that, and it's adjacent to their existing facility. My, by rezoning it um, to light industrial, will there be any um, landscaping, any anything to, to buffer the looks of? Just going to get to that. Oh, okay. Just going to get to that. Being your street man. <laughs> <laughs> but good question and good and good thought process and. Uh, uh, I'll show you that that initially their intent uh, just so as you take a look at this uh, outlot a which is there we go this parcel uh, which is kind of the mounded area over there where they have a lot of dirt storage they are not intending to do anything with that parcel at present and in order to come back and utilize that they would have to come back and get a conditional use permit from the council to do anything so the action tonight on the following agenda item after we're done with this one is the conditional use permit for outlot b and uh, under that one now that was the that was the um before um, um sean had taken over planning i was uh, in on that and the, the concern was that point right there that goes onto that bridge and whether that was going to be reinforced and then that road tarred right there so that they had access to that property now I'm wondering, are they going to make access somewhere else, or are they going to use that bridge? No, the access will remain as is. Yes. And, that's, and a that's a private access that is not a public street. Yeah, but that bridge right there is concerned with our waterway. They could not do anything. Chris Lee already I had Chris touch on that a little bit. Is they can't do anything to affect the drainage underneath that, that crossing without going through all of the appropriate reviews from the Army Corps of Engineers, Minnesota DNR, and others. So the, uh, the scope of the drainage underneath that can't be modified or changed uh, from what presently exists. And the road, that, see the bridge that's on there, if you were to take the piece of machinery that they're thinking about bringing back and forth there, um, that the weight restrictions on that drainage right there is um, going to be increased by quite a bit and before we we um, um okay that plat i just want to know is there how are they going to no, get the, in and out of there with, the, 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 the plat already exists there we're not doing anything to plant anything tonight the plat already exists and these are two outlets within that existing plat and when you take a look at the roadway that goes over the top of phillips creek there it's their responsibility to do whatever is needed to accommodate the traffic that they want to use to get from one side to the other. That is not a city concern other than that they can't demolish the drainage area underneath that road that would uh, cause any changes in the current flow to Phillips Creek. So there's a culvert. Yeah, there's yeah. a culvert underneath that. Okay. They can't change the scope of that color without going through the appropriate review processes. So I just wonder why that's not in the CPU. <coughs> because it doesn't need doesn't need to be. Oh, are they going to use that piece of property the way they want to do that? Right, they have access to it. It's just that they, they can't alter. Would you like some help from us? Sure. If, if you'd like to come up and uh, answer a question with that one, uh, I would uh, take that. Okay. Can you please uh, introduce yourselves? Yes, sir. My name is Chrissy Weiss. I am the tech service field service manager at Chart. I am currently in charge of that building. We call it Building 23. It's for my field service team of four. We keep our trucks there. We've got a Dodge. A Dodge Ram 3500 Dually, a Dodge Ram 2500, and a Ford F-250. So right now, those are the largest pieces of equipment that will be going across that road. What I'd like to do is be able to utilize this building for prefab small projects. Uh, right now, we go out in the field and we install VFP pipe, but we need an area to make our brackets ahead of time so we're not doing it in the field. And this, by rezoning it, would allow my team to do prep work in a maintained facility, a nice clean environment, 
rather than doing it out in the cold on top of a roof or trying to get it on the road. So right now, I have no reason to bring in large pieces of equipment over it. I just have trucks going forward. I may like to do um, recalibration of our Orca trucks that we manufacture in their main plant. And at that time, we can look at the road restrictions with it. But right now, it's just vehicles going over it. A truck, car, I have a Chevy Blazer that goes over it. You're These are just some of the, the site pictures. Um, I will pick up in the uh, conditional use piece, Maggie, the issue about the landscaping that would have to go on in order to obtain the conditional use permit. Uh, that's not part of the uh, the comp plan amendment or the rezoning, mm -hmm. and we'll pick that up in that part. Thank you. If you'll bear with me. So that's the uh, action uh, that's uh, open for the council's consideration is a resolution amending the city's comprehensive plan uh, to re guide the two properties to the I 1 light industrial zoning is the first action. Any questions? Or it, and it comes to my mind that it's not an issue that we, we discuss now, but it just seems like the uh, the road that's dedicated, apparently dedicated to the city for future road there is probably not going to get used. But there, there was a there was a concept at one time, long term, whether the light. Uh, excuse me. Let me go back to. Let me go to the end and get to just the aerial photo if I can here. This one is the, there was a question at some point back in the long term whether this roadway was likely ever to ultimately go through and connect up to, to 12th Avenue. And we've determined in this comprehensive planning and the way that this area has grown with the expansion and the construction of the chart industry and the utilization of uh, the property for the community center and the uh, outdoor recreation by the school district uh, that that is not likely to occur and so we're okay in recommending the uh, change in the comprehensive plan and not preserving any additional access because you would have to get into the construction of a fairly major bridge at this location here and it does not tie in well to any intersection at 12th avenue the area that you described there and i, I guess i was looking at the map too uh just north of there there is does the city control that space if it were to go through or is that owned by the school and the community center we have no publicly platted uh so we have no easements or you know, no rates to it or anything no so it would take a lot of work for us to put a road through there if we okay. wanted to so someday i think that we need to discuss vacating that or selling that land maybe and letting the uh, charter or the property owner is at it we, we preserved it in the planning process not knowing but because we don't own anything further to the north and as you take a look at that tying into 12th Avenue, it doesn't come into the intersection uh, uh, where we could have a normal four-way intersection like we would like to have. And so the reality of likely doing that. Uh, um, uh, yeah, so right now we yeah. have an owner that's maybe just going on and off our land all the time. But, uh, that's a future discussion. <laughs> Any other comments? I'll make a motion to approve an amendment to the city's comprehensive plan to rezone. Second. Okay, I got a motion by Maggie Bass, second by Sean Ryan. Uh, due to the fact that it has to be four fifths, uh, we will do a vote on roll call. So uh, if there's no other further comments, okay, uh, we'll go to we'll proceed. Uh, Council Member Bass? Aye. Councilmember Ryan? Aye. 
Councilmember Sarah? Aye. Councilmember Wolf? Aye. Mayor Nikolai? Aye. So it passes 5 0. Okay. Then the second item uh, associated with that is the introduction of the ordinance to rezone the two properties to the I-1 light industrial zoning uh, in the plan of Chart Inc. Second edition as proposed by Chart Inc. So we'll that motion. Okay, and I will second that. I a motion by Bruce Wolf, second by Chuck Nikolai. Again, this needs to have a four-fifths uh, so we will do it by roll call. We'll start the other way this time. Councilmember Seiler? Aye. Councilmember Wolf? Aye. Councilmember Ryan? Aye. Councilmember Bass? Aye. Mayor Nikolai? Aye. Passes 5-0. All right, thank you. We'll go on to the next item, the uh, resolution approving a conditional use permit number C1-2018 to allow exterior storage of finished products, used equipment, and storage trailers located at 1202 First Avenue Northwest in the I-1 Line Industrial uh, Zoning District. Give me one second to change. So this would be a question, Chuck. Now, when you say uh, storing things, you're not talking about the large tanks or anything on this property? Oh, I can't say about the I, so I'm kind of in charge of B. Oh, this is A, Mike? Well, we're not doing anything for A right now. Chart has no intention of that. So right now, for B, I would not put large tanks down there for field okay. service. Um, well, I can't get it in the building, and two, all the cranes are up in the main plant. I and, think that was, and three, we won't be able to get our straddle crane across the bridge. I think that was your concern when you saw probably the storage part. Yeah, I was really? just wondering what, what kind of um, uh, materials will be stored hmm. outside and um, uh, visible to the public. Possibly an orca that needs to get worked on. Or possibly one of my fleets, one of my trucks for my fleet. Um, maybe like a permissile, small. And an orca, you're not talking about like a whale, are you? <laughs> <laughs> okay. no, no, it's a it's a small delivery truck, three thousand gallons, three thousand, four thousand gallons. So it's a small delivery truck. Um, at this time, anything that would be outside would be my equipment. I've got pumps that I keep in boxes, and I've got a fleet of three trucks. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. You're welcome. You getting it, Mike? Or? He's a pro at it. Ken's never getting back that cracker again. You know, I, I, I get city administrator pay and planning director pay for this tonight, you know. So there's double pay for it. Well, you'd still be making more than I. <laughs> But uh, the, the request for the conditional use, as I indicated, um, is for what uh, we previously showed as outlaw B, not outlaw A. We may also keep our, our maintenance trucks for the plow season. I, I do, I've seen some down there every once in a while. So trucks with plows when it's not plow season. The background of this is uh, we've kind of uh, talked about uh, they're used to allow exterior storage, uh, finished product, used equipment, and storage trailers uh, at this uh, facility. Uh, in addition, they plan to use the pole building for light manufacturing and permitted use in the Iowa district, uh, and that part of this uh, CUP request. Exterior storage is a conditional use in an I-1 light industrial zoning district. Uh, with additional performance standards for screening. So maybe I'm going to touch on that as part of this. The public hearing was held back in November of 2018. Uh, adjacent resident, uh, Mr. Shirk at that time, uh, was opposed uh, because he didn't believe the screening would be effective. Um, Council Member Seiler uh, had inquired about head chart uh, concerns by now the neighboring residential properties really not an issue for the planning commission no, no. or the council uh, and chart had requested the item be put on hold uh, until tonight's meeting here is maybe i think uh, the best conveyance of what is being looked at uh, on outlaw b would be to finish up the screen up in kind of the northwest corner of outlaw b all along the easterly side of outlaw b and all across the southern part of uh, Outlaw B 
from the neighbors to the south. So all of that screening is proposed as part of this. Is it similar to what they, um, did we get that screen with Mommy and- That's Edward correct. On first, and they built it in, so similar type. Yeah, we would do something that complemented it, either the exact same thing or Not originally contained in the recommendation, but coming out of the Planning Commission's discussion was uh, a berm for the south row of trees, uh, as well as uh, ultimately the installation of a quiet zone sign, and then requiring dust control measures to be used on the site, uh, all of which were discussed uh, during that uh, Planning Commission meeting. Uh, staff and the Planning Commission is writing approval of uh, the CUP. Um, you can see there's the building on the site and the gravel crossing at the end of the, the cul-de-sac that we have. Uh, this is uh, on the, the site, I think, on the bottom one here looking east, if I'm uh, correct. And uh, the one on the top left is looking south uh, across the grass, uh, crossing over uh, the creek. Uh, these are just a couple of the adjacent pictures. And then this, uh, again, goes back to that uh, they will be doing the berming along, or the berming and the trees along this side, along the whole southern piece here, and then finishing up the last little piece uh, up in the, that segment uh, of uh, the site. Again, that was a reminder map that uh, I think Ken uh, left it with. And so uh, in that, the action is proposed as part of this is to uh, recommend uh, approval of the resolution uh, approving the condition use permit to allow for the exterior storage of finished products using equipment and storage of trailers uh, located at 1202 First Avenue Northwest in the I-1 Light Industrial Zoning District uh, based on the findings and the conditions outlined in the resolution to the council. So, okay. I got a motion by Rick Seiler. I guess I'll second it, but any further comments? I uh, just have a couple. The, yes. uh, the, the motion will allow any kind of storage, and it, it's not limited to even though you're describing that, uh, as I understand it. Like, so it means anything that could be, could be stored there as well. And uh, just to, the documentation says the culvert is uh, the property owners. That it's a private culvert. Does that sound that's been documented then? It, it, it is. It, that it's technically a private it's, culvert, but there are public waters conveyed through that private culvert. But the city land goes right up to that creek then, and then the, cul the road and the culvert is. Just so we don't have any. If they ever went above the tanks, then well, the, 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 I was at the meeting, and whatever the. Uh, um, it was established whatever goes over that is going to be under a certain uh, weight um, so they're not going to have the need to improve it but if they went to store like tanks over it like she says that you have to use that straddle machine and, um, uh, to pick it up if, if they wouldn't be able to cross the bridge so we don't got to worry about them storing tanks over there okay so um, the, the cul-de-sac which is the end of the public right-of-way ends at the cul-de-sac here. Oh, it's that far short of it? In the right here. The, this is where the public right-of-way ends, is right here at this cul-de-sac. Okay, this it's, diagram just looks like it's right by the water. But no, it's, pr yeah. it's private, it's private, it's a private drive from the end of the cul-de-sac into that outlaw beat. This map doesn't show it that way. Okay. But if that's what it is, then it's clear that it's the culvert's not the city. Is no, it, it is not. We uh, we investigated that and uh, took a look at that before we brought the matter in. And that uh, if it had been, and uh, uh, you can correct Bruce, it doesn't show it very well. It shows it, it intersects the culvert. Yeah, that uh, on, on, if you go back to the, the piece, uh, the map and the packet that shows the proposed landscaping with the, the green in there is that uh, that's probably a better depiction 
of where at the end of the cul-de-sac there, uh, now, now as I say that, I'm satisfied with it. I just, if there's, just to make sure there's no misunderstanding about, there's no city responsibility for that culvert. Um, there, there is none. But as I take a look at this now, and, and it's a, it's a question that uh, I just had is that uh, it appears there could be in that area of that right of way extension that we have there, uh, that part of that cuts through and does include part of that roadway that we have in easement, but effectively it's a private drive over the top of it. And one of the things that uh, Ken may have to come back as we potentially deal with this is whether there's a request from CHART to ultimately vacate um, the, uh, the right-of-way, uh, or the easement, not the easement, but yeah, the platted right-of-way uh, that extends uh, to the north side of uh, all lot A and B. So then this ordinance does require, or this conditional does require them to upgrade the culvert to the third time? If at some point. Um, uh, it's not, a, it's not yet, it's they will, right? The applicant number seven, the applicant must document that the private culvert is upgraded to a minimum 30 ton operational load rating by either utilizing steel planks or by replacement of the culvert with a concrete box culvert and must verify with the DNR that no permit is required and the flow capacity is not altered. So Ken has set that forth as one of the uh, conditions in the recommendation on the CUP to the council. So am I understanding that, that if they do any kind of storage, this has to be done? That is a condition. Okay. I don't know what it's rated now. The rating was under, yeah. It's in the, it's in the it's under 30. Wow, it's under yeah, 30. Call it back up. It's at the, keep it up. the engineering thing is in here. Is it in here? Right here, yeah. On page four of the Planning Commission report that Ken prepared. Um, that there was a loading analysis done and submitted to the city for review. Uh, and the document evaluated the existing pipe culvert that leads over the creek to determine the maximum allowed loading. The analysis noted that the operational load rating is for 20 tons of total load per passage across the culvert, while a chart was seeking to provide for a 30 ton load. So in that regard, then they have to upgrade and do certain things. Okay, to so that's that. I just want to make sure there's no misunderstanding. You, you understand yeah. that but something has to be done before you can do this. Yeah, yeah and they had, they had agreed at the time they had agreed to beef it up. So I'm assuming you're going to stick with it. But. Well, that's a condition of the conditional use permit. All right. Okay. So that's so not an optional. Storage. Any other questions? No. So we have a so motion on storage, not for me to use the building as a light measure. No. So we have a motion by Rick Seilers, uh, seconded by myself. Uh, this does not need to have a roll call. This is just a resolution. Resolution. So there's no other comments. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposition? Okay, pass the slide, sir. All right. Thank you for helping us clarify some yeah, so questions. Awesome. Mike, you're on a roll, aren't you? Just for yeah, have a drink of water, relax. <laughs> <laughs> that didn't sound like that's where you're going. <laughs> <laughs> okay. We're getting there, guys. We're getting close. Number five. Next item is the subdivision agreement by and between the city of New Prague and Quick Trip Inc. for Quick Trip Store Number 1090. At the December uh, 16th council meeting, uh, the uh, plan of the Quick Trip project was approved 
one of the conditions is that they were required to enter into a development agreement with the city to address the construction of public improvements for Street Northeast and George Avenue Northeast, maintenance and upkeep of the stormwater improvements that are going to be constructed on the private development site and for the public street ext extensions and the payment of various development fees for park dedication, the water area connection charge, etc. The uh, development agreement was put together and uh, modeled after the Bells for Edition project uh, that was done last year. And so it's gone, review, gone through review with both the city attorney's office and the developer's uh, attorney and uh, both are in uh, agreement with the uh, uh, subdivision agreement that's in front of you uh, this e evening. So it's been approved by both parties. The developer has already signed off on the agreement. Uh, there is a condition in uh, their signing that uh, it's conditioned upon them being able to actually uh, close on the purchase uh, of the, this property. So we have everything we need at this point up to their closing. And obviously the, uh, all the planning work that was done and uh, the uh, uh, approval of the subdivision agreement are one of the last things needed before they're ready to go to uh, a closing. Uh, I don't know if there's a, is it, are, are you Mr. Dean George? I am. Uh, he is the real estate manager with the Quick Trip Development. Um, I don't know that unless the council has any questions uh, with anything specifically in uh, the agreement that uh, pages seven and eight spell out uh, uh, a number of the connection uh, fees uh, that have to be paid by the uh, developer as part of this. And those have all been worked out and agreed to uh, by both parties, uh, that being the city, the city attorney, uh, and Quick Trip. And so uh, I don't believe there are any open items, any contentious items. And unless, uh, Mr. George, if you have anything uh, you no. want to say, uh, we're prepared to recommend approval of the subject of the agreement. Okay, anyone have any questions or comments for Mike? I guess I'll make a motion to approve the uh, subdivision agreement. Second. Second by Rick Seiler. There's no other comments. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposition? Okay, it passes 5 0. Thank you. Mr. Thank George, you. the only question the council might have, and they didn't ask it, is uh, any expectation on uh, how close you are to closing on the per per purchase? and when might development start? Closing on the purchase is gonna be soon, depending on when we can get the plat and the development agreement recorded, um, and then get title updated, probably two weeks out, yes, for closing. And then construction is gonna be, oh man, starting in June, something, May, May or June, one of those two. On, on the building, but we were of the understanding that there might be some site development work started ahead of that. Probably correct. I have to check the calendar though. All right, well, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Good luck. Now, this is Mar This is where Mike shines when we get into technology. You, you want to take a quick five-minute break? If you want. But you have to. OK, we're going to take a five-minute break. Someone can get a little drink of water, and we're going to ask them to the restaurant. Why don't we just limit the to five minutes? Huh? <laughs> <laughs> we actually got a long meeting now. Yeah, we got it. We have to go full section two. Can I see somewhere in the church? No, I thought they were going to name it Rick. Oh, yeah. yeah I think it is George. It is George. It's one of the east ones. The, 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 the I'll run you through that over there. Behind the building there? I do work for the farmers. Oh, it would go into the farm? I think that's what it's supposed to be. This and I think it was meant to be eventually a. Well, turn around, but then eventually with, with Alton, I think when they develop that, there won't be an access onto Alton. It then will come up that way. So, I guess my question is just a discussion about his gaming streets. I'll be right back. What time do you guys stay here until when the meetings go a little off like this?
Uh, I don't know. <laughs> this one that actually is going pretty good for a lot of the items. It's just that we got a closed session. And that one might go a little longer. Green sure. cheese comes in. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah the cheese and wine. <laughs> <laughs> I agree with you, Bruce. Uh, that should be. I wanted to name we go for a little bit there when <coughs> the city went lost. Now. Where there's continuation of existing streets, going right. either north or south, that that naming continues right. in that fashion. It's only where you get into where you have a new street that's not part of either a north-south corridor extension or an east-west extension. Can you then get into any new naming? And in your case, in front of the bank, there is that the. Uh, that was a continuation at first week. But I'm just wondering, do we have a naming construct? Yes. Policy? Yes. And it allows the developer, in those cases, just to choose the name? I'm, I'm not going to step into my planning role and guess what goes into that piece, but yes, the developer can, uh, under the policy, and we just haven't had too many, and I'm trying to recall from what Ken shared with me, is that I think they have some latitude to propose that. Uh, ultimately, the council has to, to get final buy-off in yeah. what's being recommended. Well, we, are are we you talking about that, that in this case, the George Street? That, uh, that doesn't tie into any existing east, west, or north, south. And so... But it could in the future. Mm -hmm. It, 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 it should stay with our check heritage, is my feeling. Well, I thought Chuck was saying that it might go all the way through the whole time. Eventually. No, no, not the George Street will not. It will not. The okay. George Street is, if you look at the flat, it ends no, up being a cult, is, is a, an extension of a street that would bulb and uh, be a cul-de-sac that picks up the Whit property and then the other property north and south. It will never go any further. It will never go okay. further. It's it's called no, I it can't I mean, by the comprehensive plan of They might Alton. not have access onto Alton with those uh, lots, and okay. they would go out that way, correct? That's correct. Right. That uh, Yeah, there would be no direct access from those properties that tie into this one to Alton Avenue or to Highway 19. Okay. You yeah, will so have they would have to utilize this road to get First it. Avenue. I think that's First Avenue. First Street. First Street Northeast continues up in a northeasterly fashion and then connects back out to Alton Avenue at a certain distance located north of the intersection of Alton and Highway 19. Who named it George Street? Pardon? Who named it George Street? Uh, uh, I think it's in memory of. Oh, the of the owner, owner the original, yeah. is, is why that is what it is, I think. Or is he, he's part of the original family? No, no, the, the gentleman here, the, he was uh, the real estate manager for Quick Trip that was here tonight. And his name was Dean George. Dean George. Probably and coincidentally, they wrote his name in George. <laughs> 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 Evidently, he gets a commission and naming rights. <laughs> He oh, probably is a family member. What, what is the name? Is, is the family name yeah, for the, the family that owns it? Yeah, I mean, no. So I, I was able to do part of this tonight. I can't go that deep because I don't work directly with the family or the property owners. I still so, think it should be <coughs> up to the council to decide this. Yeah, what the name of the street You approve that in plat. Hmm? You did already approve that in the plat. No, I know, but Bruce made a good point. To, I think on my personal feel is that it should somehow stay with our check heritage. And well, uh, that's owned by somebody else, so I guess they want to name something. What do you got to develop? One of the developer wants to name Jack and Jill Street or some, something stupid. Well, they like want to do the plat, you don't approve it. Well, we don't saying. allow them to name uh, North South Streets. Right. They have the same numerical. See if they'd be okay to name it as Jack and Jill and check. Yeah. Or <laughs> <laughs> I'd be like, bra <laughs> <laughs> Okay, technology. Are you ready to start, Joe? Mm-hmm. 
Uh, all right, the next one we have is uh, the one that Ken is titled Technology Refresh, and it's the authorization for the managed services agreement, uh, the cabling and the equipment for our uh, uh, updated uh, technology and uh, IT uh, items. Um, if you thought you were taking it easy on me a little bit on the planning commission or the planning items, um, please uh, cut me a little bit more slack on this one is that uh, I'm handling this but I don't profess to uh, have been involved extensively in uh, all of the uh, work that Ken did and so um, I'm sorry he's not here uh, to be able to do it. He had a death in the family and uh, he got pulled away today uh, for a funeral and uh, uh, related uh, pieces with that so that's why he's not here with us uh, uh, this evening. But uh, if you remember back in December, uh, the council selected CTS, uh, uh, Computer Technology Services out of uh, North Mankato, as our IT vendor for the technology refresh, which did include the cabling, wireless access points, servers, laptops, desktops, and the IT support. Um, and at that, uh, the same meeting, True North was selected to help perform the contract administration and taking a look at uh, all of the things that were bid uh, as part of the RFP. Since then, uh, we have been working uh, on the review and confirmation of developing the managed services proposal, the cabling proposal, and the equipment proposal uh, since uh, the latter part of uh, January. And I can tell you we have been through this, and I can't tell you how many iterations, but it has been checked, double-checked, triple-checked, which is why it has taken us this amount of time to, to get to this, because we did the review, we did an extensive building by building review, taking a look at uh, all of the technology services that go on in each of the respective uh, city hall, the fire station, the water plant, the wastewater plant, the street department. We went through each and every city building and a facility that, uh, that we own. So what you have in front of you tonight is the uh, Managed Services uh, Agreement or Contract uh, uh, or the Master uh, Services Agreement uh, along with Addendum Number 1. The second part of it is the uh, Purchase Amount for the Cabling and Infrastructure Related Items. And then the last piece is all of uh, the equipment. Um, if the Council recalls, the original technology assessment that was completed by True North had estimated the cost for cabling and equipment and a little over $443,000. The final quotes provided for a total cost uh, here this evening of about $376,330 for the cabling and equipment. And uh, this cost, uh, which included the cabling, the racks, the wireless access points, switches, PCs, a new server and backups, uh, Collectively, uh, all of this is uh, under budget from what we had first uh, envisioned. Uh, the expectation on the cabling and the equipment purchase is that that would be divided amongst uh, all of the city departments, including the general fund uh, and the four enterprise funds, and spread over five years covering 2020 through 2024 at an estimated annual cost of uh, a little over $75,000 a year, not including any financing. Uh, funding has been budgeted for these costs in the general fund and the enterprise funds. The third part of the component of it was the managed services contract uh, for day-to-day -day management and IT support uh, with the abilities that uh, once we get everything all installed, uh, even though they've been able to access it right now, is to be able to connect to our system and remotely uh, take care of problems without having to necessarily drive to New Prague and take care of it. And that's the goal and the hope is that uh, when this whole thing is done is that uh, they can pretty much manage any particular site that we have uh, through the system without necessarily having to come here unless the problem or the situation dictates that, uh, that it's necessary that they uh, be on site. Uh, the estimated uh, amount of that cost is 9930 uh, because contained within that if you remember a piece that uh, Glenn has been talking to you about, one of the things in the managed services uh, uh, agreement that got added uh, towards the end under the VIP services was dealing with uh, the wastewater treatment plant uh, for the uh, operation 
uh, and, and I'm going to forget the name uh, as I knew I would. Wonderware. There you go. Thank you. I'm glad I, uh, Jim is with us. <laughs> that uh, the whole system for running the wastewater plant is that we had to upgrade and provide service to, I believe it's uh, seven different computers is what we have out there. That hardware had that equipment had to be installed and upgraded, uh, along with uh, the server and any of the switches or whatnot. And now the Wonderware people will come in and they will provide an upgraded component of their package so that that plant can operate under the under the SCADA system, the self-contained. Uh, uh, Jim, what's the rest of the wording on that? SCADA self-contained. Uh, Management uh, system, yeah, yeah, something. I told you this isn't my cup of tea. <laughs> that, uh, uh, but the, that's a specific piece that was added that really is a component that could have been done separately than this, but we decided at the last minute to try to bring that in so it's taken care of uh, just as well as the other. So the total contract is $9,930 to do that with the last uh, $910 of that piece being specifically wastewater. They also shared part of the other cost, but that one was specifically for them, for the SCADA system and Wonderware. Well, you've got $8,710 for the VIP boarding. Is that the amount you're talking about? Or is that in addition to uh, the $304,783? In, in your packet is, the, as Ken has got identified there, for the cabling and the purchase of the equipment, that totals $376,330, uh, the cost of which is to be financed over a five-year time frame. In addition to that is the managed services contract, where they will be our provider. Right, as a remote, remote management of the system here. Well, well, they will manage all of it, either remotely or on site, under the managed services contract that we have, and it's identified in the contract along with the master service agreement addendum number one that uh, in our review uh, with city staff and the city attorney's office we made changes to the uh, VIP uh, system that's referred to in the managed services to take care of about 60 different uh, uh, computers throughout uh, the, the city uh, the contract for the master services agreement is for two years, 2012 or 2020 and 2021, uh, and there are provisions uh, that it could be extended, uh, but we went with uh, two years in the initial managed services contract. And that's 70. That's eats up the 72,000 difference that Rick was referring to. From the no, 376 no. or 304. You got your cabling is 71,547. That's the difference, I'm okay. And your equipment is 304,000. That's there, and then the monthly fee is 99.30. Correct. Okay. So those are the three elements. Uh, it, it's just, it's all kind of one paper, Sean. If you see the where's page, the 71? Yeah, page six of six F in the quote that says, uh, Quote number AAAQ45317. Oh, okay. Right, On yeah. page six, yeah. the mayor's correct, 71,000 for the cave lane. And, and all the equipment that go to the last way. page, page eight of eight, is uh, just under 305. <clears throat> and, Mike, and you probably don't know this answer, but if it gets approved and everything tonight, and someone has a computer problem, does, is it like March 1st or? that the managed system services? This actually, uh, even though we're just getting it approved tonight, they've been on site working with us since the middle of January. So if someone, so, like, someone at the golf course, like Jeff has an issue, he can call, can and or And call. there is no additional charge other okay. than what we have spelled out. So it's already this. in place. Probably. It already is in place. People, okay. they have set up on each computer, which has uh, been very nice and I can personally attest because I've had to avail myself of the use is that they put a CIT uh, hyperlink on the computer and if you have a problem or an issue, you click on it, you go in and you fill out a work ticket and it goes directly to them and they take care of it. The gentleman that I dealt with the other day when he got mine, he called me back, he took control of my computer, 
and we walked through and took care of uh, what needed to be done. So any staff person, they're encouraging people to do that, uh, at least with the current system until we go through the conversion, and even when we do, is to do that so that number one, we're reporting the kinds of issues, concerns, or problems that we're encountering within the technology system, plus it gives them the ability to then work with the individual who's calling in to get that taken care of without having to wait uh, from that standpoint. You said CIT, but you meant CTS. I, I, meant, I meant CTS. Okay, I just... Yeah. Sorry for that, it's been no, no, I, so long between the no, two. Man, that, uh, the acronyms are close yeah. enough that... Yeah, I was looking at the Master Services Agreement, as you probably know I would. <laughs> I, the only question I have is that there's no change order process. So let's say, hypothetically, they get into the cabling and they stumble into a problem and they have to use a different piece of equipment that maybe costs a little bit more, costs a little bit less, whatever the case may be. And there needs to be a change order to get that approved. There, there is a provision maybe. Uh, um, if you're look, the only one that I could find that was remotely close, but it, 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 it doesn't spell it out, is in section 1.1 services. It says CTS, CTS shall provide customer with 30 days advance notice of any change to the terms and conditions of this agreement, which I'm assuming include a description of the services. And then we can choose to opt out with a written notification within 90 days, which which would put a project way behind. So I'm not so sure that that sentence is actually what I'm where I, I need to get to about a change order process. Usually, when there's a technology project or a project management between a city or even a, a private organization, there's some sort of process. Uh, proposed to go through an approval to alter something, which could happen in a building that's this old, um, as much due diligence as as can be done. So I, I mean, it's so you a little. Think it's something like when we have a, a road project and they do something, and then before we approve the final payment. You know, well, the, the change, what I've seen anyway in project management is that. You run into an issue. A change order is written. It gets presented and approved before that work can move forward. And that's just to contain costs. And then hopefully keep the project on schedule. So I just think it's an important process to have so that um, when this whole project is wrapped up, everything is documented as why something changed from the original quote. Well, do you want a, um, a criteria where that goes into effect? Um, or what, what do, you, do you want it throughout? Well, at what point do you, uh, on the change order, I mean, if the change order is for um, 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 50 bucks, do you want to take and then well, that's actually something. evaluate that? That's or? Not, yeah, that's not for me to get down to that level of detail, but just to have some sort of a process in place that, that change order, the larger city, change orders yeah, are evaluated. The city and, and CTS are comfortable with, yeah. I mean, if it's a, a five cent piece, no, I mean, it doesn't make sense. But you can run into some more. Complicated, uh, yeah, yeah. Right. Okay. They, they spoke at length about it when they walked through the building and, and talked about, hey, if we have to core through this wall, we're gonna bid it as if we need to do that. Um, and all of their, all of the individuals that they had were experts mm -hmm. and uh, they were able to just check off what equipment they were going to place where and how they were going to do it. Uh, I know when they walked through the police area we talked about having a few um, cables pulled out to the edge of the building because I'd like to put up a couple cameras um, on the parking lot and some in the front parking lot and uh, they said hey not a problem we'll it'll be right in there and so all of those cable drops are are in that plan. Right, but but I think yeah, we I mean, all know that things can arise. Something, yeah. Yeah, something can go wrong, and as with any remodel project, mm -hmm. <laughs> something will go wrong. So it's just a matter of being able to document that change from the original. Um, and, you know, I don't want to hold this this master services agreement up. Um, you know, I would like to get it. Uh, 
pass tonight, but with the condition that there be some sort of Megan, the piece I might propose is in, or that I think uh, addresses it that I, uh, if, if I recall correctly, is that uh, under addendum number one, item number two, that labor classified as a major infrastructure change as described in the VIP services proposal will be estimated or fixed fee quoted before the commencement of said labor. The customer must authorize this work before it is to proceed in accordance with section 2.1 under the initial setup as conveyed in the VIP schedule here. Okay. So, so I, I, think it, I think it exists with that language. So, so as long as we understand what that major infrastructure change is, I, you know, and, I don't and, have, we don't have the proposal, so. And, and the reference to the, the four pages of the VIP services for the master services uh, are enumerated, uh, essentially on page one, two, and three is what they're doing uh, as it relates to all of those elements for what we're receiving under services. So if we're going to change any of those services, uh, other than what's described in pages one, two, and three, uh, they would have to estimate it, give us a fixed fee quotation before any commencement of any of that work would be done. I, you know, I, I, I see that sentence again. I don't know what the definition of major infrastructure change is. So and that's just the piece I'm missing. Um, so I guess the only thing I can do would be to uh, encourage the approval of the uh, uh, the uh, managed services contract with the uh, review uh, with the Maybe city attorney and the vendor yeah. for Is clarification on a process for a change order if subsequently needed for what's being approved at the present time. Does that satisfy yeah, you, sir? Yeah, yeah. I, I guess I don't want to hold this up. It's just a, I think it needs to be addressed. Can I get you with just one more question before we go then? Under something else? This no is all. I've got the answer, but I'll try. Yeah. Okay. I am going off of all the pages. At the end of each light item page, you'll see the line that says uh, progressive billing will start um, once the uh, solution enters the staging phase of the installation. And you've got certain amounts that are in all of these. I'm wondering at, at, at these large amounts like this, we have 92,000 here, we've got 61,000 here, we've got, are those basically a list or a schedule of the payments that are going to be made? You have the, the cabling section as to what work will be done in the respective buildings. And then the latter part is on all of the equipment. And part of uh, what is going to occur uh, in this whole process is True North is acting um, as kind of our engineer, our city engineer in the construction project. They are assisting with us to ensure that number one, the cabling that goes in, that that gets tested and does what it needs to do in all of the buildings. So, so they will be part of checking and verifying uh, to us uh, to make sure that that gets installed properly. They will also be assisting with the purchase of the equipment and the installation of the equipment to ensure that CTS is doing what we're uh, expecting of them as part of the process. So there are... That's what I'm wondering. I'm just wondering uh, if, if these, as we go along, I mean, are these the certain stages that we're going to be doing everything and that's the payment that will be paid at that time? It doesn't say no, that, Rick. No, that's just, it's just that for that stage, it's just listing the subtotal. So, so it's not really in a progressive billing. No, it will be just like on a construction project that they will have to provide a billing that shows what they've done and where they've done it and what the dollar amounts are. And so, what you're approving is kind of the upper end of, of the contract for the items that we're currently showing that are going to be installed. And so yes, they will have periodic billings as they begin to undertake the work, first starting with obviously the cabling. Uh, they'll order all the equipment in that to hopefully get that in so that they can get all of that connected up after the cabling is completed. Ken was gonna be able to talk more about the schedule, but the intent is, is that we would issue 
if the council approves this tonight, we will be issuing POs on both the cabling and the equipment tomorrow um, so that they're contractually able to begin to move forward. Uh, they've been working with us kind of on the managed services side of it since mid-January. Normally they bill by the entire month, but I said uh, I'm not buying that. You started on January 13th, I'm only paying for half a month, so he cut that to a half a month. So. We've essentially used them for half of January, all of February, and we're starting in uh, March, so we're out a little bit ahead of that, but we wouldn't be where we're at tonight if we hadn't brought them on board and to try to align ourselves because we, we jettisoned uh, or discontinued services with CIT on January 13th. Can uh, we do just one motion, or do you want to do each one? I would do each one separately if you don't mind. Okay, I guess I'll make a motion to approve the managed services agreement. Second. Second by Rick Seiler. There's no other comments. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposition? Okay. Second, cabling. I guess I'll make a motion for cabling. Second. <laughs> Second by Maggie Bass. <laughs> Any other uh, comments? All in favor say aye. 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 Passes 5-0. Equipment, I guess I'll just keep so it going. Yeah, so okay. <laughs> I'll second it. Um, so if there's no other questions, all in favor say aye. Aye. Okay, all three passed. Good job, Mike. Um, I can tell you that uh, what a relief it is to get to this point to finally be able to do this. And as we've talked in the past, as we went back to the very beginning and uh, uh, selected uh, somebody to help us prepare the RFP, did the RFP and the bidding, uh, took the bid and have been working with that vendor to get to this point now uh, to start to be able to do this. As we talked, uh, our system, as everybody knows, was kind of built on a patchwork quilt basis. Uh, what we now have as we go to implement this part of the system and the changes is a very strategic approach uh, that takes care of updating the city, the entire city system. Uh, from the work that we will be doing in buildings and the equipment to enable us to run the software, to have uh, uh, the right servers and the backup uh, and the security. Uh, I think you probably all have noticed a little bit of uh, some of the fishing that's gone on here in uh, recent weeks that uh, I think the mayor's been out uh, trying to, uh, uh, to do a number of different things. You've probably seen those uh, emails, but uh, that's all part of what they said. Uh, uh, they'll be able to tighten that down a little bit more once they get the new system in place. But it does continue to point out to all of us as city employees is that uh, you, and anybody that's on the city system, like there is on any computer system, is that you need to be wary of what gets sent to you and who it's coming from. And, uh, you know, don't open things that you shouldn't open and, uh, you know, try to manage it uh, in that sense. So. We are in constant contact with uh, the new uh, provider to uh, try to govern and take care of uh, all of these items. So. Hey, but I do want my those cards, gift cards. Yeah, you want gift cards, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Is there a on that? <laughs> I just have one comment on the, the narrative that you, you have it, that's going to be spread over five years. And I don't remember, I thought maybe we talked, was Patty going to talk to the accountant? Are we depreciating this? One? We're depreciating this, I'm assuming. Okay. Yeah, if, we're pre if this is a purchase deal, yeah, we well, uh, appreciate it. And that's our auditor will tell us because five years seems like. Uh, well, the computer equipment you can accelerate it, but you know there really isn't a, a, a lot of advantage because you're not. We don't pay taxes. Yeah, right. It, but it does affect the levy amount that we might have to right. chew on. But but I, if I, the I, auditor I, looks at it and just says, you know, because you don't pay taxes, you may just do a straight line. Appreciation. Oh, okay, but I guess my comment would still be normally fixtures cabling are longer than five years. PCs right. oftentimes are only three. three. Right. So, but they would, I think the, the auditors sure. might have a different schedule than what I, we have in the plan. Yeah. Uh, but I'm looking at financing it over five years. What Patty needs to do specifically to, to satisfy the auditors, that's between her yeah, and them. Yeah, right. Cabling uh, could be nine years. So that would affect how we. Right. Operating expense for the city. Yes. The, the intent, if you recall, from when Ken first brought this here a couple months ago, is that in, in light of the fact that uh, some of this is going to age out and to ensure that we don't get behind, was to try to take a look at uh, the investment that we're making now 
and have that be good for five years with the idea that there could be a fair amount of replacement that's going to have to come in five years. And as we look at that, as you go into the next one, resolution declaring the intent to reimburse certain expenditures from the proceeds of tax exempt bonds, uh, we're trying to preserve our financing alternatives on this one. And as you saw on the sheet that I uh, was able to, in working with uh, Baker Tilly and Terry Heaton, is we took a look at, uh, okay, we, we could use um, specifically lease purchase financing with uh, CTS and the company they use is called the Great America Lease. Well, you can see the uh, proposal on the uh, estimated net interest cost uh, of that lease uh, was about uh, almost 6.8%. Uh, I made contact with uh, Eric uh, Krogman at First Bank and Trust to take a look at it that we've uh, financed golf equipment and other things uh, through the bank and he quoted me an interest rate of about 3% uh, with no fees if he were to get involved and then I asked Terry is that in looking at what we're going to have to do with bonding for our 2020 CIP project and the highway project if we were to add this on what was her best guess of an interest rate and it's in the range of about one and a half percent. So the idea would be is that we would take what we have budgeted here, this doesn't reflect it, but this was her initial calculations, is that when we would take a look at what we have set aside in the general fund and the uh, enterprise funds and apply that capital to the purchase up front and then finance the balance of that basically over the four years is, is how we would do that but estimates uh, and the interest rate is about one and a half percent. So we really didn't want to choose the option of trying to lease purchase it from uh, Great America Lease when you take a look at that difference. So tried to show you that we did look into the, the financing alternatives of this and it appears our best bet is to uh, add it to the 2020 CIP bond issue uh, that we'll be doing later this spring, which is the reason to protect our abilities to uh, reimburse ourselves here at a later date. I support, I support this idea, um, but I would like us to consider not financing it as an alternative as well. Just well, taking out of our cash. It's a relatively small amount. Yes, I agree with that. If we don't get a bond, it, what's the bond? Is that what you're talking about? Is it paying cash instead of bond? Not financing it. Right. Well, that all goes back towards the uh, the CIP process and what we have budgeted and what we put in there uh, and all the different respective funds and the budgets that have come forward. We can certainly go back and look at that alternative and what that means, uh, but it was because we only had certain uh, amounts budgeted, uh, which in many cases, at least in the general fund, would put us in a negative position from budget for 2020 by doing that likely. Uh, and I'm not sure the respective impact on all of the other enterprise funds. Yeah, and I should have said either pay cash or borrow it internally, so you're still having the same effect, but you know, certainly, my suggestion only is to look at our abilities to self-fund it internally. The city has $20 million of cash, and I understand it's reserved and designated funds most of it, but we also have undesignated funds that possibly could be used just to self-finance it. Well, the adoption of the resolution doesn't uh, specifically do anything right. other than protect the abilities right. should we buy for it, that we have preserved that abilities. Uh, we can certainly go back and take a look at that. Okay, any other comments? No, will that be in the case I'll move it? Okay, and a motion by Rick Seiler to approve the resolution. <coughs> Second. Second by Sean Ryan. There's no other comments, all in favor say aye. 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 Okay, pass it by zero. Consent agenda. Now on this consent agenda, you a couple of things of note. Uh, one is um, the second reading, correct Mike, of the animal. Of um, the chicken, no. No, the, the dog. The pig. No, yes, yes. The animal register, uh, first reading that we've had, so, uh, and then uh, noting the uh, changes to the employee handbook. Uh, two that I 
felt that should be noted. So are there any other questions or comments on anything in the consent agenda? Just one for me on the renewal of the Delta dental contract. Um, we're assuming we were satisfied with the rates that came in because that rate page is missing from the contract. Yeah, there is no change. It's, uh, it, it's formally putting together. We've operated without a contract with them. And so now uh, they're uh, moving to require a contract. Right, and, which, which. And what I don't know, uh, oh, this is there should have been. Well, I think it's two. Yeah, they're different because. Uh, well, how did you see that? It's right on the page. It doesn't. Uh, 1.01 with this section one. Well, I know. Uh, I think well, maybe it was out of. Oh. Maybe it was out of. Order. See, this is one. Two weeks. I don't have a section one. Oh, you didn't do it. Okay. Oh, oh maybe it is out of order. <laughs> no, it's under the minus. Right All right. All you right. Then I, Mike, I think we're okay. It's just that. Here. Yeah, I have a weirdo copy. Hey, Mike. <laughs> we're talking on the. AP the payments it was dated eight five nineteen should that be three five yes I knew that there should be two because we didn't have a meeting last time yeah there should be two yep one for the eighteen and then and, and how it's <clears throat> and you and you got your answer Maggie yeah I did I just had a, a an odd copy of the the contract. Okay. So it was just missing section one. Okay. Any other questions? Did somebody have section one? Yeah, yeah. I had section one. Sean so I just did. showed her the price. It was listed in there. And then That's okay. We got it. Well, no, no, I'm missing it. Yeah. Well, maybe I was but I know it was there when we, when the contract was reviewed. No, I got paid section one payment, subscriber only 39 months. Yeah. 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 I think it's, I've got it next up. Keep going. Second to the last page. Yeah, the, rate, the rates are behind you. You saw it. Yep. Yeah. yeah. Any other I'm questions good. in the consent agenda? The other one, as long as you're just pointing out a couple things from here, sure. is that uh, there is a new request, as you can see, for a 3-2 off-sale malt liquor license for Coburn's grocery store. So we would hold a hearing on that on March 16th for you to consider that with the proposed effective date of April, uh, April 1st. Okay. But that is new. So they don't, they don't sell 3-2 now? No, they do not. The only 3-2 off-sale that we have is with Quick Trip on the uh, west end of town. So this is new. And in order to issue, for those that haven't been involved with the council, in order for us to issue a new license, uh, we have to call for a public hearing, allow the public to come in and weigh in on it before the council decides whether to approve the license or not. They've already got the clues put in, I think. Check it out on Wednesday. We're okay? <laughs> done. I just noticed the driving by. <laughs> Any other comments or questions on the consent agenda? If not, I guess I'll look for a motion to approve the consent agenda. So moved. Second. And motion by Maggie Bass, seconded by Bruce Wolf. There is no other comments. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposition? Okay, it passes five zero. Miscellaneous. Jim, you did a great job of videotaping. Are you going to be like Mitch and just give us a yep. thumbs up? All right. <laughs> Patrick? Nothing. Michael? A number of items just uh, as an FYI more, more than anything. Uh, obviously, tomorrow, March 3rd, we've got the election. We'll have staff over at St. Wentz with uh, all of the uh, part-timers uh, that we have involved to uh, 
carry out the presidential uh, election. Um, tomorrow, uh, tomorrow afternoon, we take delivery of the uh, fire pumper truck that we uh, procured about a year ago. Uh, that we take delivery in, in the afternoon, so that will complete the, uh, the purchase of that that I think we did last February, and so then the rental of the fire truck that we had from Custom Fire, uh, they will be taking that back with them. And as we entered into that agreement that if we bought the truck from them within a certain time frame, uh, they would reduce that rental in half, which they have, and then that split 50-50 between the city and the rural. Uh, I don't think we had to use that. Uh, we could have asked uh, Mr. Rinda when he was here tonight. Uh, I don't think any of them really wanted to have to use, I think it was a 1984 pumper that we had as a backup. Uh, I don't know if they ever really took it out that uh, if any of the firemen uh, would have uh, gotten out of the, the cab, a number that would have had to have stood and their feet would have been outside uh, uh, the, the, the cab, not everything was enclosed, uh, uh, but we got that out of the way. Uh, the bid opening uh, is uh, this Friday at 10 a.m. and it is uh, public and open to uh, anybody that wants to attend, can attend. Uh, so we're you're welcome to come up and hear the, the news on uh, Friday morning at 10. Uh, I believe you've received uh, the uh, uh, invite from Coburn's for their grand reopening on uh, Wednesday, March 4th at 4 p.m. So for anybody that could make that, uh, that would be good. Uh, a week from this Friday on March 13th, uh, the scale will be doing kind of a year in review uh, at the Midwaukee and uh, uh, building that we've been going to. And then on March 19th, we've got the legislative conference uh, up in uh, uh, St. Paul, and I believe uh, Maggie, Sean, and Rebecca signed up to uh, be part of that uh, adventure that day. So that's all I have. Okay. Barb? No. Nothing. Maggie? No. Sean? No. Rick? No. Bruce? Um, the rental task force, are we? Addressing that at a later time. We're going to do that next week. Yeah, we were going to have it. That, that was, week. it was, it would have been on tonight, but with Ken leaving, uh, okay. that was one we decided we could set aside uh, until the next meeting. Yeah, because we were going to decide do we want to interview these people. That was one of the things that what was it there? Let the rent your landlord? Yeah. There's, I think, a couple, three landlords, and we only needed two winners. Three people from the public and a couple of renters. So. And that's for the task force. Yes. And he was gonna. We were gonna wait to see if he could get some people to be more active and involved. With it. Yeah, he did. In that, he had a list of. I think was there nine or ten people. I don't have it. And he, then they're gonna make a, a. They're gonna come up and talk or what? No, we we have to decide which because we want two of each. We want two. Two from each category. Two landlords. Two renters and two people from the general public. And I think we might have had three landlords that are interested. There could be three from the general public and two renters. So we have to decide or something like that. I, I don't know the exact number. Or, you know, but it'll be in front of us next time, 16. Yes, right. and we can decide from there if we want to make an interviews or what. Yes. yes. And then Glenn's not here, but do you have any update on the uh, treatment plant? Uh, issue in the insurance, uh, yeah, what the status the, uh, of that is? The, uh, all of the cleanup uh, inside, I believe, has been completed as of last week. Um, the structural engineer was out and determined that uh, there was no uh, extensive damage or anything to the, either the concrete floor or the walls, so there's nothing that has to be done there. He has things lined up with um, local electrician to uh, take care of uh, all of the, uh, the lighting and uh, the heating and all the replacement items uh, that have been authorized by the insurance company to get replaced. So we'll, we will have a deductible? We have a $2,500 deductible and that's our... That should be the limit of our exposure. Then. That's correct. Okay. Thank you. Anything else? Nope. And just a little quick FYI, FYI is um, I know during the budget process, uh, it was brought up that the Gulf War would come up with some marketing stuff. Here's the analysis, here's the what Dan Gardner worked with Kurt in the Gulf War. 
And then I just did a bingo analysis for the first four weeks. Yeah, I saw that. That was good. So uh, I will update that. I, we have four more weeks left, and I will have another summary available uh, once the bingo is done. And you know, we're thinking that as long as the big pot is still out there, you know, you you, you get a bigger and bigger crowds, and as you can tell, the more crowd, the better. There's money. Better the money we do there. But that's something that I just want to make the council aware that uh, the golf board wanted to make sure you, you guys saw uh, those pieces of information. So, uh, at the end of the year, they talked about needing money to finance, and that is your financial projection, or yet? Or are well, we thinking we're not, they're going to come up short this year? Well, Just right. Play by year. Yeah, right now we we've gotten the first half of the payment. Uh, we've gotten about only about 90 members so far, and you, know, you should get around 200. Um, obviously, if, if the weather holds out and the sooner the golf season starts, you're going to get people. If the sooner it starts, people are going to join uh, because then they see more value for their membership. Um, so, you know, right now we're kind of watching it by year. I think. The last number I saw that we had 22,000 or 26,000 in our bank account from Patty. Um, so I've been kind of keeping uh, tabs with her. And, uh, I know you, you brought it up that hey, if we've got to borrow for a little bit to get a short term type deal. But hopefully, right now, we're with the first half payment because I think we had to do our first half bond payments, right, for them. They're ready. Ready. So uh, that was spent, that's some of the money spent too. We'll keep you abreast. Anything else? I guess I'll make a motion to adjourn. Second. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposition? Okay.